now we're going to get into the message today. Uh, something, and I just simply titled it today, Freedom. Freedom. Just look at your neighbor and say freedom. <clears throat> and I want us to go to the book of John, the eighth chapter, and I just want to read a setting there to us uh, that we've heard this setting before, most of us have. Uh, we've quoted it many times. Uh, John 8, 34, reading through verse 36, said, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, Everyone is, who sins is a slave to sin. I mean, he just it's pretty point blank. If you sin, you're a slave to it. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family. But, I love this part, a son, or I want to add a daughter, belongs to it forever. So if you're a son or a daughter of the king, guess what? You belong to the family forever. So if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And so if you're here today and you've been set free, you're free. Here's what I know. Sometimes people are living in bondage when they've been set free. Some people live in bondage when the cell door has been opened and they just won't walk out of it. And so one of my challenges today, I want to help you walk out of the cell. I, I want to, why? Because I know you have been set free. Everybody in here today has been set free. And so I want to help you walk in that. And so I want to talk to us today about the freedom that Jesus brings in our life. The freedom, because here's what we know. Sin produces death. That's the word of God. See, and, and people want to argue today because they think their opinion matters. And this, it really doesn't matter. You know why? Because that's just straightforward. That's what the word of God says. Sin produces death in your life. And I've seen it happen. You have seen it happen as well. Because I've seen it happen in relationships. It causes death in a relationship. It will cause, sin will cause death in a marriage. Right. Seen it happen. Seen it happen. Counsel too many people. And because of sin, a lot of times, then all of a sudden, the relationship is dissolved. They're no longer, no longer together. Not only that, they're not friends either. And a lot of it can be traced back to sin. It also causes death in the freedom of your life. Sin will keep you in bondage. It will keep you hiding out. It will keep you hiding things from people when as you don't have, again, and we all deal with that, I get that, but living in a place of sin will ultimately destroy your life and it will really ultimately cause death in your body. Sin will literally, I've seen it happen, it will kill you. And so, again, we have to understand, we know that sin will bring about death, but the Word of God says that the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. So your first fill-in today, sin produces death, but life is in the blood. I want to establish that today. Life is in the blood. The reason that Jesus Christ came to this earth is to give us life. He came to give us life. John 10.10, 10, we all know it, that the thief comes but to steal, kill, and to destroy. He said, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just have life. I want to have an abundant life. I want to have an abundant life. So we know that sin produces death in life, but the blood of Jesus produces life. And so God chose blood to destroy the works of sin. Now, again, we all understand this. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but sometimes we miss this part, and that is we miss the part that there is more to salvation than just going to heaven. You need to understand that. There's more. A lot of times people come and they get saved and they say, well, I'm going to heaven and that's good enough. There is more to salvation than going to heaven. Some people are putting off an abundant life. They'll say, well, you know what? I'll be glad when I get over there so I can live an abundant life. They're waiting till they can get to heaven. What if I told you that you could have the abundant life right now? See, that's what I'm here to tell you. you. Some of you have been taught that, you know, the, the, the poor you are, the, the, the more beat down you are, then the more humble you are. That's not true. That is not true. You can have the abundant life right now. People are all the time, well, I can't wait to go to heaven. You know what? I want to live the abundant life here. Now, I want to, don't get me wrong, I want to go to heaven, but I want to have an abundant life. And you say, so a life with no problems. I didn't say that. 
but I am saying I want to live an abundant life, and you can live an abundant life. And so let's let's let me talk you through Mark 15, and I'm not going to read it, but it's kind of let me lay out the groundwork because this will help you to understand immediately what I am talking about. There is a cosmic war that is happening in Mark the 15th chapter between heaven and hell. They are colliding and everything uh, they have, they're, they're fighting against it. And all of a sudden we hear in this setting, we hear the people cry out, give us Barabbas. The people are yelling out, and Jesus in this setting is getting ready to be crucified. And at this time, Satan thinks I've won. He thinks that it's over. He thinks that here is my chance to destroy God's plan on this earth. He thinks it's his time, and that he's going to be able to kill the Messiah. And so that is the setting where we are. Now we have to understand, since the fall of Satan, since that time happened, he wants nothing more than to destroy the plan of God. See, that's why he comes after you. That's why he comes after He wants to destroy the plan of God. He wants to destroy your destiny. He wants to destroy your kids. He wants to destroy anything you're tied to. That's what the enemy wants to do. And so we have to understand the battle begins from the night that Jesus is betrayed. He's taken from place to place. He ends up in front of Pilate and the process begins. And we always look at that and we always say that is sad and it is sad. But we've got to understand before there's a celebration, there has to be a crucifixion. <laughs> Don't miss it. Write this one down. Before there is a victory, there has to be a battle. Some of you are despising the battle, but you have to understand, before there can be a victory, there has to be a battle. <laughs> You're going through some things today, but hear me, the victory is coming tomorrow. It might not be today, but victory is coming tomorrow. You have to grab a hold of that fact and say, yeah, I'm going through something. I'm going through, I'm having to use a cane right now, but guess what? Victory's coming tomorrow. There's going to be a day that I'm going to be able to dance before God again. There's come, why? Because victory is coming. You got to understand, just because you're going through a battle does not mean victory is not on the other side. Before Jesus can defeat hell, before he can overcome death, hell, and the grave, there's got to be a suffering that takes place. And we know this suffering. And the reason that he did this was because he wants us to have freedom in every part of our life. See, if you're here today and you're living in some type, you say, I'm free in every area but one, then you're not free. You, you are still living in bondage. Before you leave here today, I want you free. I, I want you, this is Freedom Sunday. I want you to be completely free because he died so you could have freedom in every part of our life. And, and so we have to understand, we, we, a lot of times what we do is we relegate freedom uh, that, that Jesus Christ brings to us only in the aspect of salvation. We say, well, I was set free because I was saved. And we say, well, freedom's out there somewhere. But we have to understand the freedom that Jesus Christ gives us. Uh, some things, you know, he says, I want to give you this freedom. We got to understand he wants to give you some things. And I want to give you some areas in your life today that you can have freedom. Because there's a lot of areas, and I'm just going to give you four today, but there's some areas in your life that he wants to bring freedom to you. And I want to kind of unpack this for us today, because we have to understand it's not just about salvation. And so the first one that I want to talk about today, the first freedom that, that comes to us today is, number one, freedom in our health. Freedom in our health. Do you know that we have a right for good, to have good health? D do you know that? That's one of the reasons Jesus took the beating. He took the beating. That's why he took the stripes on his back so we could have good health. He did that throughout his ministry. Think about this. Throughout his ministry, Jesus is healing people. 
I mean, I, I named just a few of them while ago, but he's healing people everywhere. He's opening blinded eyes. He's making the lame walk. I mean, it's just on and on and on. Now, again, as I talked while ago, wouldn't it have been great to be alive when Jesus was on this earth? I mean, wouldn't it have been cool to be alive and just walking with him? And he's saying, well, let's, let's go here. There's somebody here that needs him. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it have been cool when he walked in the room where Jarius' daughter was? I mean, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have been nice to watch his handiwork just firsthand? To be able to to, to watch him heal the sick. Let, let me help you that today. What Jesus did then, he's still doing today. Come on, what, I need a church full of people that believes what I'm saying. What he did then, he's still doing today. That's why we're saying, look, we believe in healing. We believe, and as we're ministering to people today, and as we're ministering to people Wednesday night, all the people that you come bring in here, and we can't even pack them in this place. I believe when we lay hands on them, they get healed. You say, well, pastor, what if they don't? Not my problem. I'm just laying hands on them saying in Jesus' name. Because I believe he still heals. Now, think about this for a minute. When they talked in the Bible, they said that he took stripes on his back. In fact, there's scripture in the Bible that says, by his stripes were healed. Right? And so, by his stripes were healed. But think about it. When he took the stripes on his back, through his three years of ministry, he had already healed people. He had already healed those people. So I highly doubt that he took stripes on his back because he had already healed those people. He, he had already done that work. He already healed them. So why go through the suffering that he went through? Why would he do that? Why, why would he take that? Here, the Bible says this, that he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so if he healed people, while he was here in the flesh, could it be that he took the stripes on his back for the healing of our bodies? Could, could it be that he did that for us? Could it be that, oh, it wasn't for Barnabas, why he had already healed him. It wasn't for the dude by, by the pool of Bethesda, he had already healed him. It wasn't for calling Lazarus forth, he had already healed him. It wasn't for Jairus' daughter, but I really think that it was for Bob Wynn. I think it was for Derek Finney. I think it was for different ones in this house. I think that God took the, or Jesus took the stripes on his back for us today. The Bible says this, if there be any sick among you, call on the elders of the church. I like to put it this way, call for those who believe that he's still a healer. And they will anoint you with oil. The prayer of faith will save the sick and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You have to understand something. There, there is a, the reason I do some of the things I do and I've really exercised this a lot here lately, is I have you pray for people, not necessarily me. You say, yeah, but the pastor's got to do it. No, he doesn't. I don't want a church that says the pastor's got to lay hands on the sick for them to be healed. I want you to be able to lay hands on the sick and they recover. Away with the mindset that a pastor has to, I want you to be able to do it. Because guess what? I'm not always with you. What if you're walking through Walmart and the Lord prompts you and there's somebody there that's sick? What, what if? Oh, I know it doesn't happen today. You know why it doesn't happen today? Because we don't do it. And so the word of God tells us that if we lay hands on the sick, they're going to be healed. I believe today, I believe Wednesday night. When we, you bring all those sick folk in, I'm just coming in believing that we lay hands on the sick. I'm just going by what the Word of God says. I just need some folks to come and join me. Now, if you, if you don't think that he's still a healer, I probably wouldn't come Wednesday night. But if you do, I would be here. Let's see what God's got. So you and I, you and I have a right through the blood of Jesus Christ to say, you know what? He is still Jehovah Rapha, our healer. 
we still believe that. Let's go to the next one, book of Genesis. Adam had fallen. God said, because you listened to Eve, he said, the ground is going to be cursed. And he said, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to make a living. In other words, he said, guess what? You're going to work. You're going to work. That's why I have a tough time with people that won't work. I'm not talking about people that aren't able to work. I'm talking about people that just won't work. They say, I can't find a job. Come with me. I'll have you employed in 15 minutes. Well, I don't want to do that. You know what? I've done a lot of things over my life I didn't want to do. Now i got to quit. So Adam has the sweat of his brow, and, and, and I relate this to Jesus when they put the crown of thorns on his head because when you begin to sweat, he said, by the sweat of your brow, you know, you begin to sweat, sweat runs down your face and down your head. And I relate this to when Jesus is being crucified, they place a crown of thorns on his head and the blood starts to run down his face. The second thing I believe Jesus Christ brought was freedom in our finances. Pastor's going to talk with you for a few minutes. You're looking at me and you say, so you're one of those prosperity preachers. You know, I guess I am. I, I, I guess I am because you know what? I know what it's like to not have enough. And I know what it's like to have plenty. I can remember my wife and I have been married 42 years, and I've used this story before, but I can remember when we first started getting married. And you could buy these, this can of, of um, help me again. I've tried to block it out of my mind. Chucky sirloin. Let me tell you something. Sirloin in a can... It leaves a lot to be desired. I can't remember the nights we would have rice. And if you do this, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's probably good. I just, when you have it 50 weeks out of the year, it kind of gets old. But we would have that and we would have that over rice. And then the next night, my wife would mix it up. She'd put the sirloin stuff on the bottom and put rice on top. And then some weeks we just have rice and some weeks, I mean, again, and so we know, I know what it's like to not have enough and I know what it's like to have plenty. Now the word tells us that Jesus Christ for our sakes, though he was rich, became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. So I believe that Jesus wants to bring us back from the curse of poverty. I want you to hear me this morning, and I put this as a feeling, poverty is a curse. No, come on, poverty is a curse. Jesus Christ came so you and I could live or have prosperity. He came so we could have prosperity. He, he came to do that. Now, again, don't misunderstand what I am saying today. I'm not saying that everybody is going to be a millionaire and everybody's going to have a million-dollar home and drive a, a Tesla or whatever. That's greed. That's not blessing. Now, here's what I do believe. If it takes an airplane for you to do your ministry that God called you to, he'll bless you with an airplane. But if you don't need one, then you don't need one. Right? And so, again, we have to understand, prosperity means having more than enough. Yes. Having more than enough. And the reason that I want you to walk in prosperity is so guess what? You can have more than enough. But here's the thing. Here's the kicker to all of that. He wants to give you more than enough, not so you will have more than enough, but so you can bless others that don't have more than enough. No, wait, don't clap yet. Wait a minute, I'm not done with this. But hear me, don't always be the person that never has enough that somebody always has to give you. God says, I'm blessing you so you can bless them. In turn, they get blessed and get more, and then they bless somebody else.
Again, that's why I want you to walk in prosperity. You say, Pastor, I don't know. Well, one of the reasons that, that we need to, and Derek said uh, this a while ago when he was talking about offering, we as a church want to be able to bless others. We want to bless others. Now, we have an opportunity. We're going to be passing these cards out. They're sent back on the table. You know I've been talking about for several weeks, debt-free in 23. We want everybody to be involved in that. You say, well, what, what does that mean? That means that in 23, we can be debt-free. They have raised that limit to $75,000. They will put in $150,000. Now, here's the thing. We raised the $75,000. They put in $150,000. We paid this debt off, and we have some left over. And then we are able, you say, why does that matter? You know what? With a, with a mortgage payment, how much more can we bless those in the community? And how great would it be to say we're debt free in 23? In the middle of a recession, guess what? Look what God has done. Look how he has blessed. Look at, and that's why it's important. I want everybody to be involved in that. You say, man, I don't know. And people will say, I, you know, Pastor, I just don't have the finances. And, 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 and we get up here and you guys talk about paying your tithes and I just can't do it. I don't know why I can't be blessed. I do. I know. Because the devourer is eating everything up. Because that's the Bible. He said, you know what? If you don't, he said, the devourer is going to take. Pastor, I don't have enough. I know the devourer is eating it. Are you all here? <laughs> this is truth. This is, I'm one of those guys that's going to tell you the truth. My, my, my wife and I gave, and we didn't have enough, but we gave. And you know what? God is blessed. That's why I'm not going to be bashful if I pull up in a new truck, which I'm not going to, by the way. Here's what I'm saying. God will bless you with more than enough so you can be blessings to others. I had somebody say, well, you guys don't, you don't do nothing. You don't know what we do. I don't know what you do. All I'm saying is God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. And so let's, let's go on and make us feel better. Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the earth. So Adam and Eve gave dominion away. It was supposed to be ours. So dominion is symbolized by your feet and by your hands. That's dominion. It's symbolized. The Lord said, everywhere your feet tread, he said, I'm going to give you everywhere. That's why, and, and I just thought about this a while ago, that's why several years ago, and we probably need to do it again, several years ago when we done the salt covenant, I remember people walking that whole field. You say, why? Because the Lord said, wherever your feet tread, I'm going to give it to you. You're not connecting the dots. Lord, we're walking and we're claiming. So your hands are a sign of authority that you're given in this world. And so you say, Pastor, what's the third one? Here's the third one, freedom in our earth. We get freedom in our earth. We, we get to have freedom. Now, again, I understand the scripture says that the, the, the Lord uh, or the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but then the Lord gave it to us. It, he gave it to us and he said, do with it what you want. So Adam and Eve gives it away. And at that point, Satan becomes the God of this world. Because they gave it away. Now we have to understand something. The earth was not created for the devil, nor was it created for God. The earth was created for us. It was created, he created it for us. So, as I said a while ago, why is it that so many people are in such a hurry to leave a place that God created for us here? People say, I, I can't wait to go to heaven. I get what they're saying. I understand that. I, you know what? But I'm not in a big hurry to get there. I kind of like what God created for us. So the Bible tells us that all things are put under subjection under his feet. You know, we sing songs about that. We, we do all of that stuff. Now, let me connect the dots. The Bible says that we are the body of Christ. He is the head and we are the body. So if everything is placed under his feet, we are the body, so everything is under our feet. 
So we have to live that way. So why are we so intimidated by the devil? I mean, the Bible says he is like, and I begin to think about this, he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If we read that right, then he has to have your permission before he can devour you. He has to come and ask you, hey, can, do you care? And so Jesus came so we could have dominion. He came to give us our kingdom back. He said, this is yours. Earth is our kingdom. That's why I think you got to stand up to some things. That's why I think you can't, you can't back down. I'm not, I'm, not in, I'm not advocating an argument, but I do think that you have to draw some line on some things and say, you know what? This is how it is. And then the fourth and final thing is this. We get freedom in our lives. We get freedom in our lives. Here's what I know. Every person that I know that's lived any length of time has had a broken heart. I'd say everybody in here at some point in time, whether it be a spouse, whether it be a child, whether it be a friend, whatever it is, you've had a broken heart. Because here's what I found at 60 years old, you don't get through this world unscathed. It just doesn't happen. It's, it would be great, but, but it don't. We experience it. Sometimes as a child with a parent and we get disappointed and we experience it as we go through this world and things don't go like we think they ought to go. Here's the thing. Jesus came so that the broken part of our lives could be put back together. He said, I want to come and I want to restore you. I want to put you back together. Sometimes you will hear and I've read stories of married people, been married for several years, and one passes away, and within a few months, the other one passes away, and they say, I just can't do it. And they die of a broken heart. They just give up. My wife and I, not only doing what we were talking about the other day, and I told her, I said, I, out of us, we've been together 43 years, Started dating when we were 17. That's about all I know. I so said, if something happens to one of us, I hope it happens to me first. Because I don't know if I could make it without her. Somebody's got to take the trash out, do the dishes, stuff like that. I'm just lightening the mood a little bit. But I was serious as we were having that conversation. I... broken scripture says this it says that Jesus was tempted in all manner like as we were but yet without sin you know what he has experienced at some level everything you and I go through he's experienced it So how do I experience the grace of God? How do I experience the blessings? How can I be healed? How can I be set free? How can this happen? Well, the only way is going to be through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through faith, you can receive every blessing he has. Every blessing he has. And so I have to come to that place. You have to come to that place today that we understand what his blood has done. And he wants freedom. And so today I want us all to stand. We're, we're getting ready for baptism, but I, I want us to take this next few moments and maybe keep moving down to a minimum. Don't be packing your stuff up. We're not done. Don't just relegate it to the cross and to salvation for eternity but understand this that every day of your life Jesus Christ has come to give you freedom he said look I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly now here's what I know simply because I know some of you and also because I've lived life long enough 
there are people that are here today that some area of your life, I don't care what it is, whether it be health, whether it be finances, whether it be a broken heart, whatever it is, there are some people that are here today that are not free. Again, you say, well, I'm free in most areas, but if you're free in most areas, but you still have bondage in one, then that's not total freedom. But it's hard to live that abundant life. And so what I want to do today, again, first service, we had several came because they just said, you know, Pastor, I want freedom. I want freedom in every area. Again, it can be something simple. I'm not saying come and tell us everything. We don't, you don't have to. But I believe that it is designed by God that we live in freedom. I really do. I think it is designed by him that you walk in freedom. Who the son has set free is free indeed. Here's what I want to do. If you're here today and there's some area of your life and you say, you know what, I need freedom in this area of my life. Again, it can be anything. I want you to slip your hand up right now. I want you to say, I need freedom in this area of my life. I need freedom. I need freedom. I need freedom. Anybody in the house, I need freedom. Right now, you're here. God's just waiting on you to respond. I need freedom. I need freedom. If no hands are going up, that's great because you say, I don't need it. But if you're here and you need freedom, then we want to pray with you. We want to pray with you. So if you're here, is Israel Israel singing? I want you to just come up to the front. We're not going to be labored. It's not going to be a 30-minute fiasco. I believe it can be just like this. And God can bring you freedom. There's some of you, I know for a fact, you need, I know, I see your cards. I pray over them. I see your cards. You need freedom. I know that. And when you step up, it doesn't mean, well, you're lost. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means you're saying, hey, I, I don't have freedom in every area of my life. And I want freedom. I need some prayer team. Come up. I'll be praying for these. Some ladies come up, pray. Anybody else that needs freedom? You need freedom. You say, I need freedom. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray over you. I want to pray over you as a whole. Because I believe that freedom is going to come in every area. I think freedom's going to come in there. They're praying for these down here, and I believe that freedom's coming to them. And I want to pray for you because I know there's some of you that's standing back going, I'm not going to go up. And so I want to pray for you because I don't want you to live in in bondage. I want you to live in total freedom that God gives. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, I just declare freedom in this place, this whole place to be a place of freedom. Lord, these that have come down front, not only these that have come down front, but Lord, those that maybe are back there thinking, I I just am hesitating to go down front. That's fine, Lord. I just want you to give them freedom in every area of their life. Lord, whatever the area might be holding them up, Lord, I speak freedom. Lord, I speak freedom. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I'm trusting you right now. Lord, that they're going to know, even right now, before they leave, they're going to sense freedom coming in their life. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. I want you to sing along. Israel's going to sing, and I want everybody just to be worshiping God. We're going to be ministering here. We're going to be baptizing. And so let's do that right now. I give you my.